Welcome back, Mighty Vandals, to Tubs of the Club, your University of Idaho affiliate on the Big Sky Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brian Marceau, joined, as always, by our favorite man in Moscow. He's got the brick background. I Actually, Martin, I don't know why you have the brick background, but I like it. But anyway, Martin, producing, doing stuff we're not allowed to talk about, which I'm resentful for. How's it going, man? It's going good. It's nice to be back on after having a couple weeks off just to go on vacation. It was... Nice to be in sunny Arizona for a week, and now I'm kind of sad I'm back in the rain in Moscow, but happy to be back on tubs. And the comment section has already figured out that, um, well, hey, Dallas may eventually get here, guys. Um, he might be on administrative leave. We, we don't have we don't have administrative PhDs on tubs, so we might need someone to explain how that very, very sophisticated topic works. But in Dallas's place right now, Trevin Pixley, how's it going? Lewiston Tribune. Everyone's favorite University of Idaho beat reporter. Oh, dude, I'm so happy to be here. So happy to be back. I'll be honest with you, though. I am tired. You know, a journalist does not keep a, uh, a regular nine to five schedule. As you know, Brian, you've called me multiple times. And, uh, you know, it's probably at the 2 p.m. hour and I'm not even awake. Uh, so this this uh, pro day today uh, kicked my ass for sure. But uh, we were up and we were covering it and we were exhausted. But uh, we just got to get the paper out at midnight and then we can go back to bed and do it all over again tomorrow. Yeah, I can confirm. I've had a lot of times where I call uh, Trevin at normal person time and <laughs> he's nowhere to be found. And wait a minute. Hold up. Dallas, I am confused. Whoa. We just told every, we just told, uh, this is why, Hey, maybe we have some experts in the comment section who can help me out. Dallas. I told everyone, I don't understand how this really sophisticated process works. We're just in the intro of the show, but I said you're on admin leave, but you're here. Uh, now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's weird. Admin leave is typically a thing that, uh, you know, should be exercised very early in the process. But, uh, instead I found out I was on admin leave like five minutes ago, uh, after you guys have been trying to get me to get off of here for months. So Hey, at least it, you finally did it after fucking months or maybe even over a year. Hashtag leadership, dude. Okay. Well, hey, look, Dallas is here just for a quick minute. He's going to hop off. Um, he has he has some studying to do. But um, there, look, hey, spring football started. Trevin already brought it up. Hey, uh, Pro Day in Moscow, actually a big deal. Pro Day now, it's not just Idaho. It's multiple schools in the Northwest. But guess what, guys? That's not the lead story of the show. We have volleyball news. Um, it is, I can't, I'm not going to go as far as say it's good volleyball news, uh, but it's volleyball news. So today, March 27th, after we're, we're truly on around four months because this process was, well, depending, it could be four months or we could be at like 24 months, depending on how you're choosing to count this. Um, the 2023 Idaho volleyball team turned in after lots of other steps, um, Turned in reports to OCRI, Office of Civil Rights Investigation, University of Idaho. This is back in October. Asked for a two-week delay to push things into November. So this has been going on for around four months, five months-ish, just this investigation part. Well, finally, Chris Gonzalez, head coach of University of Idaho women's volleyball team, has finally been placed on administrative leave. Now, this was, uh, this was told to the players in a meeting today between players Terry Golick and, I believe, some OCRI representatives. The players were given no further explanation or instruction about a timeline. They were not given explanation or instruction about, like, hey, why is Gonzalez on leave now and not when this process started? Uh, according to Scott Reed, the Terry Golick did apologize to the players for how they were treated. We'll talk about that in a second. But as of now, um, assistant coaches are going to be running practices, which is to say um, either a combination of Maria Logan and I'm going to butcher this name and I'm okay with that. Romana Kriskova are two listed head uh, assistant coaches for volleyball team. So they're running the show. Only six players have been going to practice anyway. Uh, so this is not close to like normal training for most division one or even some division one teams at this point, but um, that's our news. Uh, we, Idaho, Idaho has not released the report, at least to the complainants at this point. Um, it's 
we're going to need some explanation. The university has been unwilling to give at this point about why the leave is happening now when separate reports to, to like Krem2 stated it's still going to take a couple of weeks for this report stuff to finish out, uh, which again, uh, okay, whatever, guys. But that's where we're at. Gonzalez on admin leave after four plus months. Um, Gallic apologized to the players. By the way, she, to our knowledge, and we have had people reach out, Gallic has not reached out to the 2022 players at all. Uh, to apologize for this at this point. Shocker. And the waiting game continues. But hey, Dallas, uh, go to Dallas first, then Trevin second. Um, reaction, man. I mean, my first reaction is, God damn it. I would so much rather be sitting here talking with you and Treeb and Martin about spring football because that's the fun stuff and pro day and all the, you know, the, 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 the positive good things about this university. But instead, here we are talking about, again, the same thing that if Gallic would have just tried to get in front of this, I don't know, take the player seriously at the end of 2022 when this first happened, maybe this never would have blown up in her face like this. But if you look at the OC Registers article, it comes out and says that the OCRI found sufficient evidence that Gonzalez discriminated, discriminated against players based on their origin of nation and violated three other university policies according to the 42-page report by OCRI. Uh, they found sufficient evidence that he committed sex-based harassment, retaliated against Vandal's players, and violated multiple university policies. Fucking shocker. Are, we've been talking about this for how long, and we're just now seeing that he's put on administrative leave after this report? Like, what? How, how ass-backwards is this? Like, Brian, we talked a little about this a little bit today. It, did, it didn't take like a law degree for us to be able to say, hey, this guy should probably be on admin leave. With all of these complaints that have happened, should probably you know move him away from the process and let this happen. And instead, for whatever reason, he was allowed to continue being the coach until March 27th, 2024, after the first complaints were in October and November of 2022. This it's just infuriating to me, Brian, and Treb as well, since you're going to be the one up next. It just drives me absolutely insane how this university has chosen to do the worst possible thing at every single step of this process. Had had this been taken seriously, I don't think we'd be at this point. At the, and, and Instead, we're sitting here still going into Gonzalez's, I'm assuming, lame duck year. There's no way you can give the guy a contract. I mean, you can't give the guy an extension on five wins in two years, much less all of the evidence that has just been found in this 42 page report that I'm really looking forward to us getting a copy of at some point. I, I just don't understand it, Brian, uh, Tom Kendall in the comment section, final report on the findings of the Thompson and Horton investigation could take weeks to be completed. Idaho's players have been told, I, I, look, that that's obviously expected. The getting legal involved, it's going to take some time, but I, I just am, am shocked. Brian, it, it took until this report came out to even consider putting him on leave, and now you're going to put him on leave like it's the right thing to do. Where, when, when, when did this university stop giving a shit about the actual students? It's a university. You're supposed to put the students first. That's the whole name of the game here. I'll jump in a second, but Trevin. Uh, this is this is not your wheelhouse, and just so everyone is clear, uh, the, at the Lewiston Tribune, this is being handled by the news desk, correct, Trevin? Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. definitively, this has been assigned not to Trevin Pixley, but Trevin, jump in, man. Yeah, uh, I'll echo like pretty much everything Dallas said. It, it, it's really been surprising how Idaho has handled this the worst possible way at every turn, and like. They still find like small, tiny things to also trip over themselves, you know, like like they posted on the Idaho volleyball Twitter account. And it's like, why would you do that? Like, you know, this is still ongoing. And, and it, it's just they continue to slip over themselves at every single chance that they get with this situation. So not only is it bad, are they handling it bad? But, you know, they also go out of their own way to get in their own way at times, you know. So it, 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 it's hard to, you know, kind of back that up, especially when this coach not only is a, you know, terrible person, but also only has five wins. You know what I mean? So, so you know, how are you going to defend that? So that, that's my take on it. Yeah. So, hey, Jason Mayer in the comments section saying disappointing how much ass covering is going on as the first priority. Which, hey, Jason, that's exactly how this reads. And I, I want to talk about the Scott 
the Scott Reed article that Dallas referenced, which cited again, sufficient evidence that Gonzalez committed sex-based harassment, retaliated against Vandal's players and violated other university policies. Reed was able to cite this as a 42 page report and the university columns is saying it's still going to take a couple weeks for the report to be finalized. Um, someone square the circle, but the university is, is on purpose. This has just been leadership via it's been mailed it in at every level. Uh, leadership wise. I'm talking about all the way up to Scott Green, guys. We love, we typically love Scott Green on the show, but he's going on a book tour about crisis management while uh, he, incredible crisis that is, and hey, this is being handled. I bring up, bring up Green. This is being handled outside of athletics. I messaged when I, when I got news that Gonzalez was on admin leave, I messaged in the athletic department and their correct response was, Hey dude, like I actually don't know much about this because this is not handled from the athletic department. Uh, you got to go to Jody Walker. She's the one who actually knows about this stuff. So let's just say like, Hey, this isn't just a Terry Gollick failure, which it is. Um, this is, this is beyond that. Um, but there's a lot of different ways for this to go Dallas. Um, the first one being, this is the Gonzalez being put on admin leave feels like the very first step in the correct direction of the university acknowledging not only were the, we, we, we've covered this on the show, over two years, more than 30 people made attempts to contact Gallic about this. The people who made who made these contact attempts, they, they were correct. If Gallic needed to apologize to the 2023 athletes, Hey, but she needs to apologize to the 2022 athletes because they're the ones who started this. They're the ones she initially ignored. They're the ones who she, as a mandatory reporter, failed. Do, do we think Gonzalez didn't do 2022? Also, hey, in the comments section, we got Kurt saying apologize to the 2023 girls and 2022 who transferred out. There you go. Yeah, if the current players deserve an apology, everyone in the field associated with this deserves an apology i'm waiting for that to happen now of course the problem is going back to what jason says about the feel of this being ass covering well if the university goes out and apologizes for 2022 they're admitting they failed and there's at least one head other than chris gonzalez that has to roll in that case that's terry gollick uh, she's gotta go brian she has to go there is no there is no excuse if if terry gollick's call, contract gets renewed i will cancel my season tickets and i will never support this university again this is fucking asinine in the in the article we don't know what was said word for word all we know at this point is that multiple players contributed to the the reporting in this article idaho athletic director terry gollick told the players of the move saying no student athlete should have to endure what the idaho players have gone through and apologize for the length of the ocri investigation Last time I fucking checked, this is Terry Golick's fucking fault, man. Terry Golick is the person that could have done all of this and prevented every single bit of this from happening. But instead, she did fucking nothing. Nothing for these kids. Get Sorry. the fuck out of this university. You got Kurt in the comment section saying that just, hey, specifying the timeline question I had, Dallas, that um, for OCRI, the players have time to rebuke or clarify what was written regarding them so that could explain why hey there's a 42 page report for scott reed to reference but then a final version to go forward but not shifting topics man like no you're right like this is the next step if i i, I so first thing i just want to enunciate here um sometimes there are some times that you really do need expertise to understand a second a next step or how something should be handled sometimes you don't and it turns out all of the idiots online, people like us, who said Gonzalez should have been on admin leave, they're right. And I say this because we've been in contact with the players. Chris Gonzalez has been on his best behavior during the spring practice season. He's been doing more, more work to try to do like team building stuff than he did in the two years combined. He's taking feedback from players. Hey, way too little, way too late. But that's all to say there wasn't a traumatic event that just took place. He should have been on the admin leave the entire time as virtually anyone following this has wondered like how, how, how it's a screw up. That's it. it it's, it, it's a fuck up. That's it. So, okay. We're waiting for the next step, but the next step seems to be, well, let me rephrase this Dallas. We need to get a finalized copy of the port uh, for that. We know Scott Green will get and the players, the uh, official complainants get a copy too, which is how Scott Green has publicly said he's not releasing his report, but, University can't control what the complaints do. So if you're a complainant, volleyball player, 
Uh, tubs the club at gmail.com is a great place to send that copy because we look, we want to go through as much as we can. We've been, uh, I think, the most aggressive place covering the story in any sort of Northwest news. So, uh, players, you want to help us out there? We would love to help you out to the extent that we can. But we're waiting for the finalized report and then the decision on getting rid of Chris Gonzalez, which seems like a no brainer if that stuff was substantiated. There, uh, look, any a good coach should probably be gone. If that stuff is substantiated, not like the worst coach in any program in Idaho, but then second um, clock's ticking on what to happen with Terry Golick. I expect we're going to have them pretend she retires by not renewing her contract, which expires on July 31st, 2024. Not that we're counting, but those are the next two steps that we're, that we're looking at is if this was allowed, this was allowed to happen. We know what happened for multiple years. That isn't just a Chris Gonzalez thing. That's a failure of leadership. That's a failure Failure of support, failure of organization. Look, we had Debbie Buchanan on who talked about the failure of um, f- female senior administrator that every university has to have due to Title IX. Well, they, that's Terry. So, uh, look, at Dallas, before you head off, anything else you want to talk about with volleyball? Man, just how how unfortunate this is. Uh, my time at the University of Idaho or some of the best years of my life uh, got me through a bunch of a bunch of rough moments just the community of of vandals that i had around me and it's it's just a it's just devastating that nobody stuck up for these girls for years and now here we have terry gollick with the ass covering nobody should have to go through this you're the entire reason that everyone went through this if you would have done your job correctly a year and a half ago none of this would have taken place and it's just it's just disgusting treb it's good to see you man I'm looking forward to having an, an, an actual like fun episode to, to hang out with uh, Kevin in the comment section. Good to see you as well, man. Uh, thanks guys for hanging out. Uh, Can I, I keep you on for one it. more second, Dallas? I oh, just, boy. sorry. Are we look, we hashtag only tubs, patreon.com backslash tubs, the club uh, support the show. Uh, Patreon guys knew before anyone else knew. I'm like, I got, we got screenshots to prove that if anyone yep. really cares, but Jason Mayer in the comments section, just for clarification, the Terry Gallic apology was specific to the amount of time the report took. Um, that actually makes this worse. It's not just that uh, from the OC register, uh, Jason, Idaho athletic director, Terry Gallic told the players of the move, the admin leave saying that no student athlete should have to endure what the Idaho players have gone through and apologizing for the length of the OCR investigation. So two parts, but uh, you're not wrong again. Like, Hey, my like apology for the fact of the experience and apology for the length of uh, time. I, by the way, haven't heard of any sort of like apology for her part. Don't, uh, don't hold your breath guys. Um, But anyway, we're going to follow this as we have news. Um, And I guess one thing I want to say, Trevin, you're going to get back in a second. Um, I have to Dallas. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Dallas has to go back to doing, doing different types of work. So, Hey, the hammer time cameo is over. Thanks for coming on. Um, I just want to or clarify. I, my, guide you, Dallas. <laughs> I just want to clarify on my, I will, end. I will hopefully be on the right track after my test tomorrow. Treep. Oh, and then hey. we'll be fine. All right. See you guys. God be then, with uh, you. <laughs> hey, saying the quiet part out loud for me on volleyball, which is, Hey, when, um, Look, when you're hosting, hey, boring, the way shows work, Doc, when you're facilitating the conversation, you have to hold yourself back a second, a little bit to just keep the show moving. This is like, th- it's hard for me to be more disappointed in how the universities handled this. Um, they've, they've failed athletes for multiple years and they're continuing to fail athletes. Like, look, we, we lost, threw away 2022, 2023, 2024, no matter who coaches is looking like a thrown away year with how late in the game we're either going to have a new coach who has to put things together in what uh, late April or something like that Yeah. versus, or we're good. I don't think it's possible for Gonzalez to come back. If he comes back, I don't think he's going to have a team and that's not, not exaggeration. And I think if Chris Gonzalez comes back, the volleyball community might not let Idaho, ha- Idaho have much of an out of conference schedule anyway, because yeah. that's the, that's the volleyball community attitude toward Chris Gonzalez as told to us at this point. But Hey, with all that said, uh, I don't know how you screw this up more. It's it's incredible how much this has been screwed up while Scott Green is on a book tour about crisis management. While Terry Golick has her whole time here uh, been tried to come across as a technocrat, as someone who really, really has the ins and out of administration down. Honestly, she got the football hire 
And a lot of that covers up a lot of screw ups. This is just so catastrophically bad that even Jason at kick and ass like he has in every way is not going to let the people are not going to going to ignore this. So, yeah. well, hey, Terry, well done. You had an absolute you, Terry was dealt essentially what, like pocket aces or something like that and found a way to fold. Well done. So, uh, yeah, congrats, guys. Well, said. Gonna, we're going to we're going to cover this as it's a, it's an evolving story. As we get to last steps, we will cover it. Um before we now shift to football, which Dallas is right. This isn't the most important thing at all, but this is a this is supposed to be the fun time of the year where we're we're it's no stakes pretty much. We're just talking about fun about spring football, guys maybe going pro, new coaching staff, all that stuff that gets people motivated to buy tickets and all that stuff. We, that, that's not close to the most important story. Way to go, yeah. Terry. Way yeah. to go. I so, know. Okay, before we get to before we get to football, which we are going to talk about second half of the show, uh, Martin, glad I could give you no notice. We got to talk about something that doesn't disappoint ever. Hughes River Expedition show sponsor, uh, Hughes River, run by a great vandal called Scott Hughes. They've been kicking ass for for quite some time. I mean, really, since 1976, it's been vandalone. Here's the deal, man. If you're looking for any sort of week-long vacation, if you want to go outside, see the great outdoors of the most beautiful part of the country in a way you are you wouldn't be able to otherwise, have the kind of trip that you and your family will talk about for the rest of your life, get a hold of Colin. They do they do things like multi-day trips down the middle fork of the salmon or the main salmon salmon river run of no return. They got special trips like the one to see the Purse Meteor Shower. You to camp on pristine beaches, run amazing hike water, hike scenic trails, spot wildlife, soak in beautiful natural hot springs, fish some of the remote remote stretches of river in the country. They take care of everything. You just show up. The trips are all inclusive. So truly, bring enough clothes to not get an indecent exposure charge. HRE handles the rest. So call them now, 800-262-1882, or check them out at HughesRiver.com. All right. So first thing we got, first thing we have, uh, Martin, let me know in the comments section who uh, who we just did that to. So, I think it might have been a mistake on my part, but it's not who you think have. it is. Okay. First so first, new, first piece of news we have is Idaho has a new defensive line coach, uh, Trevin which the new defensive line coach, because uh, David Lose was last year, who, the guy who Dan Jackson had essentially promoted, promoted to coach the entire D line. He got an offer from San Diego state to go join Rob Orich. He took it. So in, in his pl- in the place of David Lose, we have not a new head co- new to Idaho, but Loney Fongupo, a uh, defensive line coach. He's, He's pretty young, but relative to yeah. his background, like, you know, he's, he's about 35, 36, something like that. Um, his coaching background is is pretty young, but he played the NFL too. His route to Idaho was, hey, he played at BYU. Uh, then he had a pro career that lasted from about 2012 through 2015. He, he saw active roster stints with both the Seattle Seahawks in 2012 and the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2013. And other minus uh, from 2013 on, he bounced around a few different practice squads. After retiring as a player, he becomes a BYU graduate assistant in 2015. He gets his first collegiate coaching job at Snow Junior College as a defensive line coach. He's there for two seasons, 2017, 2018. Then he coaches at Utah Tech as the D line coach from 2019 to 2023. And the part that I don't know if this is correct, but I'm going to pretend it is. On February 25th, 2024, Football Scoop published a story that Fangupo, uh, who goes by Loney, would be coming to Idaho State uh, to join Cody Hawkins' staff. And if that happened, it lasted about three days. Good for Loney, who bounced up right away from Utah Tech to Idaho State to Idaho. But he's going to be coaching defensive line. Um he also spent some time. He was at Texas Southern in for the 2023 season as a defensive analyst after Utah Tech. So, uh, with that as the background, Trevin, your reaction to new D line coach Loni Fungupo? Yeah, you know he's a uh, he's a guy that's moved up quickly. You know he's uh, everywhere he's gone has been a step up for him, and he's a massive guy. He was walking around a pro day today. He's a big presence. Um, You know, as far as what he's done at these stops, you know, I'm not insanely familiar with what he's done, but I think, you know, it's probably about the same production maybe you're getting out of 
out of Lose, which is a good a good look because that's a guy that went to uh, a Division One level. So um, it's going to be interesting. So I don't really know a whole heck a lot a whole heck of a lot about him. I told you guys I'm tired today, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see what he does. So to me, it hits it hits two things. Uh, one, I've liked how Jason Eck has had a staff that is. It's a, it's a mix of ages. It's a mix of backgrounds that I I just love. That, that that's the approach. And okay, we you want you want to talk about an older addition to the staff in the off season because we now have I believe uh, four four new coaches who were not on the roster last year. Hey, so Hunter Hughes who came over to coach Sam's and Nichols. He's hey he's a relative to Loney. He's on the older side, but then you know Loney Fon Gupo, He's not not yet forty. So. Mm-hmm. One, it's just a no. It's another guy with a different background that I, I love. You know, he played some JC football as well as going to BYU, and he played pro. So he's got he certainly has the pedigree as a player to buy respect immediately. Uh, but se- second, and this is not the most important thing in the world, but um, getting having the Polynesian connection on the coaching staff. Yes. I think a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches aren't going to bring that up because of course, like, Hey, well, like no one hires because of race. He was hired because he's competent. But the fact of having another person with another diverse background that can connect with another group of people uh, to bring them to university of Idaho uh, to me, that sounds like it's two for two. I mean, I want to contrast that with university. Montana is mostly hiring older guys who are on the, Twi- in the twilight of their career doesn't mean that that doesn't work. How Montana just made the champ. They made the championship. They just hired Scott Linehan as an offensive analyst, but like, Hey, that's the route. Bobby Houck is going is uh, o- older guys who are probably of the same mindset as him for the most part. Jason Eck is different. He's, he's getting people from all over the place. The age range is pretty wide. The background is pretty wide. I like that. It's obviously worked in Moscow for the two years he's been there. So uh, that's my reaction to the Loney Fong yeah. hire. One thing I will say about the coaching staff this year is it seems like it's, it's more of an overhaul this year. You're going to see more new coaches than the first two years. So it's going to be interesting to see um, how that dynamic is as opposed to the last two years, especially with the uh, varying levels of coaching experience. But I think the big thing is that Eck, uh, Schleisner, and Linehan are still there. So that continuity is going to be big for them. And uh, Franks as well in the de- defensive end. Yeah, so if you count all the analysts, there's 17 total coaches on staff. 13 of them are returners from last year. Now there's some shuffling in there of roles as well. If you factor in the shuffling of roles, you can say like, hey, there's 13 familiar faces, but there's 11 people with the same roles last year. Six guys then who have roles that are at least partially different or just completely new roles. But you're you're right. There's There's a core that stayed. And a handful of and a handful of new people going in, but that's the that's honestly the hallmark of a good FCS staff is people move. That's how it's yeah. supposed to be. So, with that said, you, Trevin, are have been our eyes on the ground. Spring football has just started, but um, I want to spend two minutes just talking about spring football itself because we're in a different time in Idaho to talk about spring football. If you guys were, if you guys are longtime listeners, you probably remember the energy, honestly, the anxiety of covering spring football in Jason X first year when hey phase one was okay. Does this guy know what he's doing? Then last season, it was a little bit more relaxed, but the question for Idaho was look, Idaho hadn't had two consecutive good seasons in forever. So yeah, guy, the, he, he did it once. Can he do it again? Eck has shown nothing but competence since being in Idaho. And even with last year's team underperforming, I thought I'm fine saying that they, last year's football team underperformed offensively, but were very strong defensively too. Um, so, which is to say made up for shortcomings in one area and, you know, advanced to the final eight in the playoffs. I'm in X third spring season. I'm not anxious at all, man. Um, and I think most Vandals shouldn't be. And that's a great thing that spring football now for Idaho, it doesn't feel like a life or death thing, or it shouldn't feel like a life or death thing anymore. This is now uh should you should feel relaxed. You should feel like, Hey, this is my last shot of football before the big desert. I always talk about um, until, until August. And we get to see, Hey, what are we get to see some new names? We get to talk about guys who may be contributors and just look at the rooms, but it's a much, it's a much different viewpoint, Trevin, than we had the last couple of years. And I love, it's weird to say this. I, I love that spring football feels 
it feels kind of, I mean, as a fan, it feel, I feel at ease in a way I can't ever remember feeling as a Vandal in the spring. Yeah. And I, I, that goes back to Jason Eck and what he's doing with the, the coaching staff, because there, there are some, you know, significant departures there with Hayden Hatton and Jermaine Jackson. I, I think being like really the, the two major guys that you're going to miss and Anthony Woods, and we're going to get into some position groups later uh, that we'll dive into, but you know, that's what good coaching does is that even though these like key stalwart players are leaving, you know, you got confidence in this coaching staff that they are good recruiters and they can, you know, work the transfer portal and bring confident guys in or guys that they believe in uh, to work in their system. And even though there's going to be some new faces in these skill positions who may have not gotten a lot of reps, you know, just with the right coaching, they could, you know, mold into good players. I mean, you've seen that with Jack Landry. And we'll, we'll talk about Jack Lane too, but you've kind of seen it with just even getting two game reps. I mean, he's a guy that, you know, just practices every day with the twos, you know, comes in with the starters every once in a while. And just right when he's ready for a game, he's, he's in. And now he's pretty much, you know, he's the guy. So it's, it's exciting to see uh, what this coaching staff can do to these young players. And look, to, to talk spring football, I think the easiest thing is to go position group by position group. And spoiler alert, Vandals, we're not hitting every single position group today. Not a chance. Um, there's two uh, places. We're not doing a depth chart, depth chart deep dive today? I was going to say, oh, you, the tra- I, w- I will be going through pretty much every single position throughout uh, spring football. So pick up a copy of the Lewis and Tribune. Oh, for sure. Look, hey, Trevin's, yeah. uh, Trevin's coverage on Idaho is must read for a fact. I'm just saying today we've got about 20 ish minutes left on the show. We're not going to be talking about every single position position group today. We eventually will, but over that's going to be over the course of, of a couple of weeks. There's two position groups that I want to talk about today, Trevin, for opposite reasons. Um, one is an area of complete turnover and, and a lot of uncertainty. And one is, pretty damn established i want to go with the easy the slam dunk one that's pretty short first trevin which is say um jason eck look on uh, on chris king's show last week jason eck referenced quarterback being a bit of a uh, he, he alluded to it being kind of a battle between jack lane and jack wagner and i'm just gonna say like i think the jury's in Everyone knows who is starting as quarterback for Idaho this season, barring a catastrophic injury, which is what everyone tries to avoid during spring, and barring one of the freshmen coming in, just exploding in a way that until we see it, we can't expect that's going to happen. The Vandal quarterback room, it's not hard to read this. I mean, hey, look, phase one, just talk about the Vandal quarterback room. There's so there's, Well, hey, there's six dudes on the roster right now. Uh, for our returners from last year, that means two were new. There's not a single transfer at quarterback for Idaho. There's also only one non-freshman. Jack Lane red, will be a redshirt sophomore. Every All the other five are redshirt freshmen or true freshmen heading into next year. I think there is virtually no doubt that Jack Lane is going to be a starting quarterback for Idaho. And Trevin, I'm going to throw it to you so you can make it, it lets you reference the pro day that you watched today. We also got a piece of evidence from Pro Day that I think if you're curious about who's throwing passes for Idaho, uh, you shouldn't be. Yeah, when you told me that, he said that on Chris King's show, I was kind of shocked because I remember talking to him after uh, Idaho got hit with all those transfers and I had interviewed him and talked to him about all that. He he had just instant confidence in Jack Lane, that that, that was his guy and that's the team's guy and that's who they're going with and – you know, maybe just a couple months have passed and, you know, things do change in that aspect. But at Pro Day today, Jack Lane was thrown to the receivers. And and that's cool because I will say this. I don't think Giovanni did that. Giovanni, I don't think, did that last year. I think it was Matt Linehan that was actually throwing to the receivers. So the fact that uh, Jack Lane stayed after and threw to the receivers during Pro Day was awesome to see. And he was, he was delivering some good balls. There were a couple – uh, off target passes there uh, towards the end, uh, mostly to Jermaine Jackson. He kind of missed Jermaine a couple of times, but he was on with Hayden and TJ. Um, but but he looked the part of a starting quarterback today for sure. Well, and to to clarify my point, Jack Lane threw passes at Pro Day. Which other Vandal quarterback threw passes? The, at the whole the whole point of Pro Day is for the guys 
who are vandals to show how they're they can potentially be pros which means hey it matters they do need support to make this to showcase their skills what other idaho quarterback threw passes to idaho receivers on pro day yeah none of them correct none none there was only one guy exactly 100 percent. yeah you're right yeah so hey quarterback room very simple it's Jack Lane's barring a catastrophic yeah. injury or barring like Holden B just being a uh, good in a yeah. way that we're not ready for. But until that happens, it hasn't. So until that happens, we know, look, we've seen Jack Lane already play Jack Lane's mm-hmm. kick-ass guy. We're happy. He stayed. So I'm again, like, Hey, the theme for me, for me right now of spring football is mostly like relaxation, like the anti-anxiety. Yeah. Just talk, think about Jack Lane, what we've seen from him. He kicks ass, man. I'm yeah, no, absolutely fine guy. with that. Yeah, he, He's the guy. But two things. I, I, one thing I do want to say is that Holden B is really good. And so is, uh, I think it's Rocco Couch or Koch. I, I can't say his last name, but I just think both their Coke. Uh, yeah, both, Coke. both wrong. But, uh, you know, those two guys, they're, they're flashy on tape. So, I mean, Idaho's QB room is really, really good really solid and you know they haven't played in college you know gone through a college practice schedule or anything yet so we don't know i don't think they're going to take jack lane's job i don't think there's a chance but it's going to be interesting to see them throughout the spring and develop in fact i was i was talking to pete harriman today from the the spokesman um and we were just talking about when giovanni first got the job and jack lane was practicing with the scout team and me and him both were just watching jack lane throw with the scout team because of how well he was throwing the ball and you know there could be you know one of those two guys with the scout team you know throwing the ball really well and drawing some eyes so. okay you're right but of course yeah yeah jack lane no like even looking good the scout team he didn't start yeah which is no, not no, a no, no, no. Yeah. it's to say look we know it's we know what it's going to be is going to yeah, have, 100%, it's going to have to be a tectonic level shift or event take place for 100%. Jack Lane to not be starting quarterback, which uh, the only thing I want to say about quarterback additionally since then is if you think um, the, the quarterback room itself actually has changed a, a lot. If your time span is a year or so You're like, Hey, Ridge Dutch, who transferred, he's in line to be starting at Bryant this year. So hey, that's cool. Um, yeah. We know CJ Jordan's gone and now Giovanni's gone. It was actually, there's a lot of quarterbacks to have left over the course of around 12 ish months. And for Vandals to be like, yeah, I'm cool with it. Don't care. I absolutely am fine with the roster we got. We're going to keep moving on. We're going to just move on, call it good, man. So the other position group that I want to spend more time on, uh, Trevin, which I'm going to have to lean on you a lot more here, is the opposite of quarterback in that. There actually, there isn't. So defensively, the, the area where there's the least continuity is defensive backs. And it's not really close, uh, which reason, reason I'm saying that. Say if you look at defensive line. So the Idaho's D-line, who we'll talk about in a different episode, there's 21 rostered D-line players right now. 17 of them were on the 2023 team. And the four new guys are all freshmen. So like, okay, D-line, we'll talk about the individual players. But we, those are mostly known quantities who are looking at improvement and maybe, maybe Dan Jackson's scheme explaining how things are the same or different next season. Secondary, not secondary is not the same. So in the secondary, uh, right now, there are 16 rostered players um, who are, sorry, 16 rostered defensive backs right now on the Idaho football roster. Eight of them return from 2023. So like, hey, half half the DBs in the rooms are completely different. But the the other thing I want to bring up in of the people who didn't come back, hey, we guys like we know Marcus Harris or and or Monty Arnold are gone. But hey, if you if you look at the two deep from Idaho's last game against Albany, you know, hey, playoffs. Um, the if we're look, looking at the at the two deep of in the two starting safeties position, we do have. Three, so we have three of those top four guys back in Kyron Beecham's back, Tommy McCormick's back, Dwayne McDougal's back. That's great. Mervyn Kenyon's gone. That's one. At the cornerback slot, we have both starters, Marcus Harris and Armani Arnold, are gone. So that's a way to say, like, hey, there's a lot of a lot of production through a place. But that also means no matter who starts, whether it's replacing as a starter or replacing as a number two, there's a lot of reps 
that are going to be replaced on this roster. So first thing, Trevin, what are you looking at out of the defensive backs in spring football? I think first you look at the three transfers that they brought in. I think those are the three that are going to kind of take a bulk of those snaps or at least try to replace some of that production. Which um, another- pause real quick. We'll get back to get right back to your point. Those three transfers are Corey Thomas um, from Northern Iowa, Abraham Williams from Weber state, who we'll talk about in the return game, but he was a starting yeah. cornerback in Weber state too. And KJ Trujillo from North Alabama. Yeah. I think those guys will, will play the biggest factors there, but you got a, yeah, Andrew Andrew Marshall, who I liked last year. I think there were times that he looked like a freshman, but I mean he got a lot of playing time for a freshman last year. And I think he's a he's a kid that will, you know, get some snaps and play a crucial role this year. Um, just thinking of corners off the top of my head. I, I should have pulled your the outline up today, but um I know I know there's a couple of more young DBs on the roster. I know Hayden John didn't get a lot of snaps, but he's a guy that uh, Jason Eck kind of talks about a lot, you know, as far as like a, a two or a three guy. Um, I think this is a group that while they don't bring up a lot of guys back, they've recruited heavily at that position, uh, not only this year, but last year as well. So I think there's just, there's just some guys creeping up that we haven't heard of yet or that haven't hit the field just yet. Um, that will make an impact this year or at least underneath those transfers. Yeah. Additionally, Cam Stevens from the 2023 team who saw some time as a two, he's gone as well. So yeah, he's gone. Yeah. He's gone. Yeah. There's, there's a handful of that, that spot in particular is going to be different. And, you know, I don't in the, uh, in the interview, I heard Jason Eck recently, like he referenced KJ Trujillo is a guy who, who's standing out. When I talked to Dan Jackson during basketball season, he was pretty high on Trujillo and Corey Thomas. When I talked to Jackson, that was before the Abraham Williams news. And Abraham Williams was good enough to start at Weber State. Now, he was most certainly not the number one cornerback when he when he played for Weber. But Weber, hey, Weber's a strong defensive team. He was good enough to be a starter on that side of the ball. So I feel good about the, about the guys we have coming back. But so to put it simply... We have those three transfers. We also have returners, Tommy McCormick, Andrew Marshall, Kyron Beecham, and, and Dwayne McDougal playing so, who you can reliably expect those guys will at some level be either starters or number twos. And those seven-ish are going to make up probably a a good majority of the snaps at at cornerback and safety. At do you so with that as your your roster to start with, Trevin. I guess how let's take your temperature. How are you feeling about the defensive backs right now? I feel potential there. I think, you know, you got Stanley Franks as a coach. You got, you know, a new Nichols and Sam's coach coming in. I think that there, there's a lot of potential there that can be tapped in the safety positions. That's a good group of three. I think that's a really good group of three right there. Tommy McCormick, Kyron Beecham. I think he's, he's Tyron Beecham is one of those guys that, doesn't get really talked about a lot from last season, but he had a lot of defensive plays, uh, turnovers, which Idaho didn't get a lot of last year, big tackles. Um, he was a standout last year. Tommy McCormick's always a always a consistent piece. He has been since Jason Eck took over. Uh, Dwayne McDougal, whenever he's on the field, he's, he's fun to watch. He's a hard hitter. Um, I, I, I like the safeties there. And they, they just have such, like, they have a lot of corners, and I think that um, I see Diesel Wilkinson. Diesel Wilkinson. I've seen him play in high school. He's fast. So I'll get out. I think he's going to play safety though as well. So I think he's going to kind of add into that mix. Drew Faulkner's another kid uh, that looked good in the fall camp last year, uh, like Martin said in the comments. So it's just it's a gut. It's a group that there's just so many numbers there that they've they've added to over the last couple of years that there's, there's bound to be somebody to rise up. I mean, you look at guys like Armani Arnold, he got $150,000, you know, rising up through the ranks of Idaho's DB group. Yeah. I want to talk about the transfers. So Trujillo uh, who transferred as referenced before, he was at North Alabama 
uh, prior to coming to Idaho, but before playing it, North, he's, he's a bit of a, and this only exists in this generation right now. He's a college journeyman. Uh, in that he's <laughs> yeah. you know, retro senior. He played at university. He start played at both the university of Colorado and at Wake Forest university prior to going to UNA. So, Hey, like at the time, both those are power five schools at the very least, you understand that is having some of that, the raw athleticism that explains not only the initial recruit, but when he transferred, it was from power five to power five to start with. Now, Hey, when you move your way down to FCS, that's obviously because you're not lighting the world on fire at that position. But the fact of that athleticism to me, having not seen Trujillo in a Vandal uniform, that explains to me, okay, I get why this guy could be a contributor. I get why he played at North Alabama. Talk about Corey, uh, Corey Thomas from Northern Iowa. Look, he also is an FCS drop down, an FBS drop down prior to coming to Idaho uh, before playing at Northern Iowa. He was at Eastern Michigan. He played in six games as a six games as a sophomore and then seven games as a, as a, sorry, as a junior said that wrong six games a sophomore seven as a freshman seven games as a um, a sophomore before going to uni to play his junior year so again fc fbs level talent not every drop down again not every drop down dominates when they come to the fcs there's there's reasons why guys move down and if he's at eastern michigan eastern michigan solid not not a football powerhouse but still you know they're, they're solid um but he wasn't playing there a ton I feel okay about, again, about the the fact of the athleticism of a guy who was playing FBS before he came down here. So that's where I feel good about those two. And then Abraham Williams, he's an All-American kick returner. He's yeah. probably the best kick returner in the history of the Big Sky, which is saying something because the Big Sky has had some pretty damn good returners. So it's, it's wild to think that as a kick returner, uh, Idaho had Jermaine Jackson last year, and this is an unmitigated upgrade at that position. Yeah, I know. It's wild. And, Incredible to think, but uh, I'm going to guess that the reason Jermaine uh, Abraham Williams is at Idaho and didn't move up is because he wanted to be both a kick returner and see the field in the secondary, and that's why he's where he's at. But either way, athleticism-wise, um, I feel good about all three of those guys. I feel obviously feel good about returners like Tommy McCormick, Kyron Beecham, had one of the bigger had had some big plays too. Dwayne McDougal seemed to get better and better as the year went on. Last season, he's a transfer in from NAU, um, where somehow he didn't play at NAU. And NAU look, NAU has a new football coach because Chris Ball was fired. But I I feel that in spite of all the changes, and there's also some you know coaching changes too, with Hunter Hughes coaching the Nichols. Um, there, that is the single defensive group that is going to have to deal with the most new names, new faces, new roles. But I, I feel like the raw pieces are there to explain why this group could still be one of the better second, probably not the best secondary in the big sky, but why this could be one of the better secondaries in the big sky. Yeah. And they're going to have to overcome one of the, uh... Idaho's biggest bugaboos last year, which is turnovers. They're going to, you know, have to cause some turnovers this year. That's one of the biggest things I think this defense needs to do because they were a solid group last year, like you said. You know, in every, like, metric, like, as far as yards and against a run and things like that, um, except for towards the end of the season. And then when they can't get turnovers, you know, that's going to cost you. And that's the big thing. It's going to come from the secondary group. Can they do it? Yeah, I mean, you know, it just that it's so wild to think how how Idaho did last year with that turnover issue. Um, I, in one sense, I hey, we're talking like the theme is anxiety, and my takeaway is don't be anxious. Um, on one end, turnovers are a variable stat, as in Fair. there is always a degree of luck in in the in turnovers because people out the ball, uh, hey, a fumble has to bounce the right way or a tipped pass has to bounce the right way. Now the players have to do the other end of come down with the ball. And last year when Idaho had opportunities for the most part, they were not, but because the fact of being variable, it isn't exactly shocking to see Idaho in 2022 be the best team at forcing turnovers in the big sky. And then 2023 be the worst that like first to worst bounce and turnovers is that's much more expected than let's say to make that same uh, best to worst bounce in run defense 
or in you know overall pass defense. So see what you're saying. I think it's going to be hard for Idaho to not improve just because I think last year the team, the luck factor in turnovers, Idaho just wasn't very one. Idaho was a little bit less lucky with bounces. And second, uh, Idaho did squander a lot of opportunities. Like they, they were there. We saw, you know, like against Idaho State, when the guys make the plays, the turnovers come. Of course, you know, the downside is we don't get to play Idaho State every week. But long way of saying, I, I, look, I think the question for Idaho, I, I think Idaho, this far away hot take, is unquestionably going to be better at forcing turnovers. Uh, also, hey, the transfers in the secondary who are coming over, they, they, they force turnovers at their previous spots. Yeah. Dan Jackson does have a has a DB background as well, so that's a huge plus. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, we talked about quarterbacks. We talked about safeties, cornerbacks, uh, defensive backs overall. Trevin, while we have you on for our last couple minutes, um, you want to want to talk about pro day? Sure, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about pro day. I'm working on the article right now. Uh, it was, it was a good atmosphere. One thing I will say is this was way better than last year, and it was weird because there was two – well, two teams and then two full teams going at it and then a Central Washington, a handful of Eastern guys. Um, but really well run, and um, some some little standout uh, performances from me. Uh, Ty- Tylen Coleman had a great day today, and so did Trey Thomas. Both those guys probably stood out the most to me in an event that you were probably just I and Jermaine Jackson and Hayden had uh, both of them did good uh, in their measurables uh, as far as you know, the jumping, the benching and things like that. Um, when it came down to like their individual drills, they had to do drops and one-on-ones and things like that. I think it's so hard to do those kind of things as a defender and as a lineman uh, in pro days. I think it's much easier for like quarterbacks and receivers to kind of show what they got. I mean, with a D lineman, you don't have pads on as a linebacker, you know, you can show your drops and things, but you know, you don't really get to demonstrate your vision and whatnot. So I don't think those two parts of their day were necessarily impressive on that side. I'm going to have to say Hayden had looked the best and that was, you know, to be expected. I think if any scouts are going to be hesitant on his measurables he didn't necessarily put like break the world uh, with what he did today. Um, his vertical put him just outside the top 10 uh, based on the combine, the NFL combine, where he would have ranked. Uh, his 40 would have tied him for dead last. So while it was a, a 40 that he said that he was happy with, you know, still not the fastest 40 in the world. Uh, Jermaine Jackson had some drops in his uh, individual drills. Um, he still ran a pretty quick 40, but I think he was capable of running something quicker. Um, Hayden fell in his three cone drill. So th- there wasn't, everything wasn't picture perfect today for the Vandals, but, uh, I think with Hayden, he did enough with his ball skills where, you know, maybe they'll see that and he might be a late round selection there. And I think, you know, Tylen Coleman might've done enough with his measurables that he might appear uh, maybe getting a roster spot or maybe playing spring football uh, somewhere later on. Same with Trey Thomas. I have nothing to add on pro day, Trevin, because I was not there, Uh, but I will say I like the idea of it becoming a little bit more of an event with multiple universities showing up. Um, And I think, look, I think part of my understanding is the, is, there were far more pro scouts th- for this pro day. Than is typical. Yeah. yeah That's typical for an Idaho pro day. And look, Hey, some of that has to be Hayden Hatton. No question. But I think I bet some of that probably has to do with combining the, the schools so that I'm sure So it's yeah. only one visit, which is to say, Hey, everyone wins. If more, more, yeah. if we get more vandals in, fu- in front of pro scouts, if that gets more guys on ro- active rosters or pra- practice squads, that's a, that's one for the university. And it also lets it – there's only so many football events in the spring anyway. It feels like it, Pro Day could maybe turn into a little bit more of a circus in a good way. If this is something people now can like reliably predict is going to happen of multiple schools, one play, one place. Yeah, that's kind of – that's what I was talking about in my article too. It, it was such a supportive environment 
uh, for all these schools too, because you know not only were their teammates there, but their families were there because it was open to the public. So I mean, it was it was cool. You know, like you said, it was it was an event. I mean, the the bleachers were were or the stands rather, you know, whatever were were filled. You know, pretty pretty good today. And uh, Idaho had like their own little section while they were you know rooting their guys on. Uh, Jermaine Jackson, when he ran his first 40, it, it looked a lot faster. You know, Treb clocked in at a 448 for Jermaine Jackson. You know, so I think Jermaine should just take my my 40 and call it good, but probably won't do that. And after he clocked his 40, Jakari Larman goes, he broke it. And then they're like, what do you break? And thinking he broke the record. He's like, I don't know, but he broke something. That's for sure. That guy's he's the funniest player on Idaho's roster. Jakari Larman. So, Jesus Christ. So, hey, before we head out, two things I have to hit. Martin, uh, our producer, crack research team, brings up, hey, why did Abraham Williams end up at Idaho? Was going to go to BYU, but credits didn't transfer. So, voila. Um, It's incredible to me that Weber State, with its well-worn transfer pathway to BYU, would have issues with credits transferring. But you know what? I'm cool with that. I'm absolutely happy. I'm stoked to have Abraham Williams here for the year, year that we get him. Uh, Another thing to clean up is just in the theme of us talking about secondaries and uh, why that was a focus for me. I'm not saying Idaho had the best overall defense uh, secondary in the big sky last year, but there's a couple important metrics where Idaho was the best in conference, specifically in passing yards allowed per game and in uh, completion percentage. Idaho uh, best completion percentage by a bit. Uh, teams completed 53.6% of their passes against Idaho. Next best school is Montana at 58%. So uh, it's a way of saying the that room. I, I think that's just going to be a, a continuing story as we finish out spring and the start of next season is we know who some of the mainstays are going to be. We know Tommy McCormick's good and he's going to start. Uh, we know that Karen Beecham has played pretty damn well in his time too. We know Dwayne McDougal's played pretty damn well also. But the, if Idaho is going to maintain that level of production or improve, some guys we have not seen are going to be the reason why. So with that said, Trevin, thanks for coming on. Um, right track guide at Treeb Talks on Twitter. Any, any Before we head out, any closing thoughts? No, it's always a pleasure leading you hooligans on the, on the right track. Um, we'll have a pro day article uh, in the Lewis and Tribune tomorrow. I'll be at practice uh, tomorrow and, you know, more, more spring football to come in the Tribune. So pick up a copy, follow me on Twitter, however you want to do it. Well, hey, like I have to hit your origin on the right track. Uh, reaction, <laughs> Idaho men's basketball has two players in the transfer portal, Quinn Danker guard and EJ Neal guard. Your reaction, that means Idaho has essentially three open scholarships that we're aware of at this point. Yeah, uh, Quinn Deckner, I'm a little, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little, you know, indifferent about you know, even though he was the leading scorer, I'm a little kind of indifferent about that. I, I would have liked to see EJ Neal stay. I think he was really a pribble guy, and I think that he would have he would have come on eventually. I think he was even coming on. You know, I think he was a good player. You know, I, I would have liked to see him stay uh, in Idaho. But uh, for Quinn, kind of being the the best scoring option that Idaho had this year, I think they could do better. Not to say that he was completely bad, but I mean, you looked at that game against Sacramento State. I mean, it took them until the fourth quarter, like 12 shot attempts to make a field goal. Yeah, so my reaction to that is um, it's actually hard to say this and not sound caustic, so I apologize. Um, I, I, I agree with you on EJ Neal. I think he was miscast offensively. Um, he's a 3 and D guy. He needs to not be a guy who the team's relying on to create offense, and that's where he was because who the team is. Uh, so I look, I kind of miss him, but one, I think Ida, Idaho needs to get more talent. So the roster, Case the one. open roster spot does matter. We'll get that. Um, Quinn Danker. I get, this is the part where it's going to be hard to be not caustic because I appreciate like, Hey, we appreciate Vandals when they're here, but if he's your best guard, you're going to be terrible. If Quinn Danker is a primary ball handler, you're going to be terrible. Uh, he, also, as the year went on, his judgment got worse. His defense got worse. Part of that might have been the pressure of being a number one scoring option when he just he needs to not. And hey, if he's your number one scoring option, you're going to be bad. There's just no no other way uh, to look at that. So 
one, I don't think it's his fault because the team needed a guy to create shots and he was the one who at least was able to kind of do it at times. But if Quinn Danker is your best guard, there's a ton your offense can't do. So um, I wish him luck. I'm happy for the open roster spot. Uh, with uh, Honestly, with how guys move in and out, sometimes it's hard to know the right way to talk about it um, because you know when guys are here, we're supportive, but when they're gone, they're gone. They're not Vandals anymore. So... I don't know, man. I'm, I honestly, I'm happy for the open roster spot. Uh, like you brought up, hey, Case, why not opened up his recruitment after uh, Danny Sprinkle left U- Utah State for University of Washington? Um, I'd love to have Case, why not on the team? One of the things Idaho needs next year is shot makers. Didn't have enough of them this year. And if there's one thing we know Case, why not can do that, dude can make some shots. So we yeah. love it if he's going to be here. But if he's Utah State caliber recruit, you got to know Utah State caliber schools. We'll probably come calling about this time. Um, so we'll see as that goes. But at this point, Idaho men's basketball, two people in transfer portal. Um, Andy Cost, Andy, Andy Kaus in the comment section saying, Quinn would have been better off the bench, both injuries. He's what we had. Um, Andy, you're right. He should have been off the bench, but I, I don't think he started because like Murris got hurt. I think we just didn't. I think Bribble just swung and missed a little bit in year one. That's okay. He started late. Um, everyone gets at least a year of grace. And there's a lot of good. The, there's a lot of good from Pribble. We talked about that in our season recap show. But if Idaho's going to be move up the rankings next year in the Big Sky, we we just need some better guys. So with open roster spots, we got got to hit some at the very least. Um, Idaho needs to start hitting some doubles to triples and maybe a home run with some recruits. Can't can't get by with singles and strikeouts. So with that said, thanks for joining everyone. Martin, you've been the shadows. Anything you want to throw in before we call tonight? No, it's just I'm excited. Hopefully there'll be more football stuff next week to talk about. And yeah, I'm just it, spring football's here and hopefully it'll be happier trails and happier track talks from here. Well, okay. I'll push back. Well, I gotta enunciate one thing. Obviously, there's gonna be at least one episode where it's not. Cause when the report's out and we find out what happened coaching wise, um, I don't, that's the volleyball story is not going away until it's an actually done story, but Martin, you're right. Um, when we don't have volleyball, spring football is all is good news and it, it'll be, you know, those are the fun stories we're waiting for. Hey, Mark triple piece, Idaho hockey outscored ISU 21 to three this weekend. That's some of those stories that we're talking about. Thank you, Mark Taylor cash and loved it. So yeah, as a, to debrief real quick before we call tonight. Whenever the volleyball news hits, we'll record as relatively time sensitive as we can. Other than that, but uh, you know, once the volleyball story is resolved, it's spring football all the way until the spring game in, in April. And then, you know, we, we have a couple episodes, like we do a questions episode once a year uh, that we'll, we'll run through as well. But Martin is broadly right. Most of the episodes are going to, are going to be a little bit more fun than the first half of this one. But that volleyball story matters. That's why we're following it. So with that said, thanks everyone for showing up. Share the show, tubs the club dot Patreon, patreon.com backslash tubs the club for hashtag only tubs. Discord costs less than a cup of coffee or more. We love people who spend more than a cup of coffee on the Patreon. Help support the show. Go Vandals. Go Vandals. Go Vandals.